ferments are really important in the Sonnenberg lab out in California. They showed that essentially a, a high fermented food diet was more effective than a high fiber diet at improving markers of diversity and overall gut health. So I think the implementation, like the integration of fermented foods can be super beneficial for individuals looking to optimize gut microbiome composition, gut health, digestion, um, and just overall setting themselves up for like healthy inflammatory and aging process. So yeah, absolutely. I could totally see, you know, things like natto, kimchi, sauerkraut being great additions to somebody who's trying to maintain a lower carb diet, but still getting these good molecules in to feed the bacteria that are associated with the healthy aging process. Today's show with Dr. Alexis Cowan is brought to you by Myoscience Nutrition. As you can tell, we're talking a lot about the microbiome, the interplay between the microbiome and metabolic health and intermittent fasting and much more. One tool that can support your microbiome and metabolic health is berberine hydrochloride. The new berberine fasting accelerator by Myoscience features a super concentrated form and highly purified form of berberine hydrochloride with synergistic nutrients like alpha lipoic acid and biotin. Now, the reason for this formulation is to help you kickstart your fast. This is one of the, the best use cases for this. Now, many people don't realize that when you finish your last meal, that is time point zero of your fast. And that is a great time to consider taking one to two capsules of the new berberine fasting accelerator to help accelerate the metabolic effects of fasting and to help increase levels of ketones and to curb some of those cravings for sugars, for cookies, for ice cream, and for high calorie, but low nutrient density junk food. So you can check out, I think there's over a hundred reviews over at myoscience.com on the new berberine fasting accelerator. Again, highly purified form of berberine with synergistic nutrients, biotin, as well as alpha lipoic acid. You don't have to take four capsules. You can start with one to two shortly after or before your last meal to help curb some of those food cravings. The URL to save is myoscience with an S. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E dot -E com, myoscience.com, and you can use the code podcast at checkout. So let's cut back to it with Dr. Alexis Cowan. Alexis, great to be with you. And before we started recording, you were, we were talking all about the microbiome and intermittent fasting and some research about how exercise impacts the microbiome. And I think mm -hmm. maybe a great place to start would be with a paper that you co-authored in, in a uh, research study that you were involved with, with regards to metabolites changing with intermittent fasting. If I understood that correctly? Yeah, so I mean, uh, in my research at Princeton in the Rabinowitz lab, we were focused on understanding the metabolic adaptations that occur uh, in response to different inputs into the system. So diet and or fasting lack of food. So on the diet side of things, we compared ketogenic diet to a high carbohydrate diet, and this was all in rodents. And we also brought in fasting as another element to that. So it's like two disparate dietary settings um, one with a high flux of carbohydrates coming in, low fat, the other one very lo low carbohydrate and high fat. And then obviously with fasting, there's no dietary input coming in. So we wanted to see how metabolic fluxes in particular changed within the body. So the flux or the like turnover rate of these metabolites basically will tell us how much of these nutrients are being used within the tissues. So if, if carbohydrate flux is high, that means tissues are readily taking up and or spitting out carbs. So like taking up glucose, spitting out lactate, for an example. Um, and if fat flux is high, that means fat is becoming a major fuel source um, in this state. So basically what we found was that surprisingly in the ketogenic diet state where there's basically no carbohydrates coming in, and this was for like three weeks on the diet, so no carbs for three weeks, we essentially saw that carbohydrate flux, specifically glucose and lactate, uh, their flux or their turnovers were kind of maintained. So they looked similar to fasting and it was about like a 20% reduction from, you know, a high carbohydrate mouse. And so this was surprising to us because, you know, you would think the body would shut off these pathways if you're not getting carbohydrates coming in. So what's going on and how are we maintaining mass balance of carbohydrates in this state? Because like basically we have to account for where those carbs are coming from if turnover is maintained. And so basically the takeaway from our paper, which was called Quantitative Fluxomics of Circulating Metabolites, uh, that was in cell metabolism, we showed that um, there's essentially these metabolic cycles that exist that maintain flux through pathways despite the dietary inputs coming in. And so essentially what that does is uh, if you're not consuming carbohydrates and you're consuming mostly fat, that means your body's going to naturally maintain flux through the carbohydrate pathways so that... 
when carbs do come in, those pathways are already ready to go and onboard those nutrients. If they were to shut off, you know, if the organs were to shut off carbohydrate metabolism completely in the absence of dietary carbs, then there would be a lag within which, you know, it would be hard to adapt to the sudden influx of carbs from the diet. And then the same thing um, with regards to like a high carbohydrate diet, if the diet is high carb, low fat, the body wants to maintain flux through these fat metabolism pathways. So we get fatty acid and triglyceride cycling that basically allows for, you know, future dietary fat to be rapidly assimilated. Um, and so that was kind of the major takeaway from the paper that the, the body is very robust to disparate dietary inputs. And it does this by maintaining these quote unquote feudal cycles through these pathways that allow uh, for rapid adaptation to changes in dietary nutrient exposure. That is so fascinating. Now, was there a period of that adaptation where um, you said the flux was maintained, but mm -hmm. was there like a like a nadir and then it increased or something like that? Or did it just, it was constantly, it maintained itself from you know pre-diet manipulation into post? So we didn't look at the like temporality of the changes. We basically wanted to just ensure that the mice were very, very ketotic. So they were in deep ketosis mimicking something like a year of, that a person would be in ketosis, uh, comparing that to a mouse that was on high carb diet basically its whole life. Um, and then for the fasting period, we would look at mice that were about eight hours fasted. So that would be roughly equivalent to like a day or two of fasting in humans. Um, and so essentially, you know, I don't, I can't say for sure, like the, the dynamics of the changes, but essentially, you know, what we were most interested in is like in this very extreme state of carbohydrate deprivation, this carb metabolism was maintained. And so that was like the most striking thing because, you know, even in the short term, you could expect, okay, maybe it's because carbs were only restricted, you know, a few days before or a week before, but even, you know, three weeks later when there was certainly no traces of dietary carbs to be had left in the body regarding glycogen stores and things like this, that we still saw the maintenance of, of glucose and lactate turnover. So this was really striking to us. We didn't expect it at all. I think that's important because there's this perception that, well, the brain requires a certain amount of, of carbohydrates per day in order to function, mm -hmm. but in the absence of ingesting those carb carbohydrate uh, from the diet, that there are these backup pathways that can help these obligatory carbohydrate utilizing neurons and so forth. And so mm -hmm. for people that do have this perception that, oh, I need to have bread for my brain, how does your study and implications of that and other associated research help people better understand that perhaps if you benefit from a ketogenic diet, your, your neurons are not like starving of fuel. Oh yeah, totally. So we already know in a ketogenic diet, you know, you're going to be basically breaking triglycerides down into free fatty acids and glycerol. And this glycerol quantitatively contributes to glucose production in the liver. So that means as glycerol levels go up, um, basically th that glyc glycerol is turned into glucose in like a first order way, in a concentration dependent way. So you know, we can make more than enough glucose that we need to support, you know, these neurons that require glucose. And glucose has a particularly interesting role in the brain. Um, it's kind of a tangent, but I think it's super interesting that the brain doesn't take up amino acids from the periphery. So in the blood brain barrier, there's no amino acid transporters, very little gets actually into the brain. And this is primarily because neuro uh, neurotransmitters in the brain are largely composed of amino acids. So they're either uh, made from amino acids or amino acids themselves. Like glycine is directly an inhibitory neurotransmitter within the brain. And so you can imagine if you have, you know, a high protein meal, you don't want these amino acids to be directly influencing neurotransmitter levels because that could be catastrophic for an organism, you know. Um, it would result in death, most certainly. So essentially what the brain does is it can take up glucose and this glucose can be converted into these really important neurotransmitters like serine, glycine, um, and glutamate. And so in this way, the brain can regulate its neurotransmitter supply by regulating the, the metabolism of glucose within neurons. Um, so I think it's an interesting thing to consider in the, in the context of like neurodegenerative disease, because we know that glucose uptake is impaired in this setting and that, you know, you're basically probably going to have a, a limitation in the amount of neurotransmitters that are going to be produced because you're limiting this very important, not only fuel supply, but uh, anabolic precursor in, in glucose. So it's an interesting consideration, but in the context of ketosis and like, you know, in a healthy body, the brain can use ketones very effectively. And it's actually a more efficient fuel source than glucose, you know, at a carbon per carbon level. So, you know, we can make enough glucose from amino acids from glycerol to support the brain. And then in addition to that, providing ketones is another really, you know, amazing fuel source for 
for the brain. Um, and, you know, a lot of people will anecdotally, they will say that they feel uh, like they're sharper and like they can focus more and have more energy when they're eating a more low carb lifestyle. So it's very interesting in that aspect. And I think um, it's just important to consider how like adaptable the body is. Like we don't necessarily need any one nutrient at a given time. It's like something it's more so like what we eat overall that's going to like influence our, our, our body's health or disease over time. But in a given moment, you know, we're, we're very flexible species and that's why we're, we, we thrive as a species because we are so adaptable and we can survive in so many different extremes when it comes to diet or environment. That's fascinating. So just to unpack um, the amino acid transport part that you mentioned, so glycine directly inhibits by making GABA, is that? So glycine, glutamate directly can be made into GABA. It's like through like one metabolic reaction, uh, gl glutamate is turned into GABA. So that's important because glutamate is a major excitatory neurotransmitter and GABA is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter. So the metabolism of glutamate to GABA is going to control the glutamate to GABA ratio essentially and like how much excitatory neurotransmitters are around. And we know actually uh, ketogenic diet is at least partially working in epilepsy through this way. So there was a paper out in Cell a few years ago that showed that basically the sh there was a shift in the GABA to glutamate ratio in ketogenic diet. And that was at least in part mediated by the microbiome. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially that was directly contributing to the anti-seizure effects of the diet, which has been used for uh, epilepsy for over a century, but the mechanisms behind why it worked were always kind of elusive. So now we're starting to understand the connection between the diet, the microbiome, and the ratio of these key neurotransmitters. And what about like um, dopamine precursors like tyrosine and, and DL phenylalanine? Mm -hmm. People have been taking these for a long time, but mm -hmm. did I hear you say that these amino acids don't cross a blood-brain barrier? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. There's a lot of interesting research showing that um, there may be this retrograde transport of neurotransmitters from the gut to the brain. And so this is something I think that's interesting to consider because we know that, for example, serotonin, a lot of serotonin is made in the gut. Most of that serotonin is for the gut's function itself, so for motility and peristalsis. But there's also this emerging area that's, that's alluding to the fact that some of these neurotransmitters in the gut may be transported uh, via these afferent nerves back to the brain. Um, that can then influence neurotransmitter at the level of the brain. Wow, that's yeah. fascinating. So perhaps some people might be experiencing benefit when they take like say high doses of tyrosine mm -hmm. from peripheral norepinephrine maybe, or mm -hmm. the retrograde transport that you mentioned? Yeah, okay. absolutely. And it's, it's kind of hard to pin down um, exactly what's happening. Even using like metabolic tracers, you know, if you get labeled dopamine in the brain from like a tyrosine tracer, we don't necessarily know if that dopamine was made in the brain or made in the periphery and then transported into the brain. So uh, there's definitely some math that could be used to work out the, the origins, per perhaps, of the, the tissue origins. But uh, I think that research is definitely still emerging, and I think it's a really interesting area. That is fascinating. What do you think about urinary neurotransmitter testing because some people have been promoting that as a way to assess anxiety depression mm -hmm. things like that you just mentioned that a lot of serotonin in the gut is for peristaltsis and mm -hmm. motility so if you're doing some sort of assessment to figure out what is the origin of someone's anxiety depression is it serotonin mediated or dopamine or what have you mm -hmm. do you see any utility in that sort of assessment yeah i mean it's a good question it, it's not necessarily the case that the, the peripheral neurotransmitter levels will be reflective of central neurotransmitter levels. So I think, I think that would need to be further validated in order to hold water. Um, there's also that other interesting paper that came out a few, a uh, few months ago, like earlier this year, that showed that serotonin levels weren't actually correlated with depression, which was kind of a paradigm shifting observation. Um, and it was actually like a, a meta-analysis that showed, you know, they basically compiled all these studies done over the past decade or so and showed that there was no meaningful relationship between serotonin levels and depression sy sy symptoms. Um, but I think part of the story that's maybe missing with that is that serotonin levels don't necessarily uh, correlate to serotonin release. So people with depression may actually have a problem releasing serotonin, and that can contribute to their depression. But if you're just looking at the concentration of serotonin, yeah, maybe there's no effect. But whether those vesicles are actually releasing serotonin and contributing to those 
feelings that we associate with serotonin as a neurotransmitter, that remains to be seen in my opinion. Yeah. I got a lot of blowback when I shared that paper oh, yeah. from people that are on SSRIs or SNRIs right. because they experience benefit and then it made me realize there could be off-target effects like anti-inflammatory effects or other issues, that mechanisms that hitherto haven't been elucidated with regards to how those drugs might impact people. So yes. it was kind of interesting to, to just see like the general public's perception. Like some people were like, oh yeah, I tried an SSRI and I, I had all these side effects and other people were like, no, it saved my life. So mm -hmm. could there be some off target effects, do you think? So we absolutely know that some SSRIs are directly modulating the microbiome and that could very well be influencing, you know, neurotransmitter balance or other, you know, aspects of brain function. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised at all because I think actually, you know, some of the, the studies that are looking at microbiome modulation, like a lot of the effector molecules they use are going to be like already approved drugs. And SSRIs are among like the most potent stimulators of like different changes within the microbiome. I don't know the exactly specific shifts that happen there, but it's well known to create a, like a modulatory effect. Hmm. Yeah. And maybe improve diversity or some such. Possible, yeah. I, I'm not too familiar with the SSRI data specifically, but it's possible, yeah. Speaking of the microbiome, as it relates to exercise, we're talking about how um, there's high responders to exercise and some people who are really not motivated to exercise and that might that effect might be being mediated by the gut and dopamine. Mm. Um, let's talk about that. That's super fascinating to me. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I, I was mentioning how I'm potentially going back for my postdoc in January uh, in, in Christoph Tase's lab at Penn. And he was telling me yesterday about this really cool paper that's going to be coming out in Nature soon that basically showed that there's uh, groups of microbes within the gut that make these molecules called lipid amides. So they're basically like fats with a, an amide group attached to them, which is a chemical modification with nitrogen. And that these lipid amides interact with peripheral nerves to stimulate the release of dopamine in the striatum, which is like the part of the brain that, you know, where dopamine is released, it's going to incite movement or like basically encourage movement. So essentially what happened in their studies, they, they showed that the people who have the most of these lipid amides um, at, from these bacteria, and actually this might have been done in rodents and then they're moving on to do it in a clinical trial, but essentially what they showed was that the mice that had a lot of these lipid amides around were more motivated to move, so they would, would experience more wheel running uh, behaviors. And that if you kind of removed these bacteria, it would result in a more sedentary animal. And if you actually provided a supplement form of the lipid amide, you could restore running behavior. Um, so it's like a really interesting observation that basically relates to gut microbial composition and 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 the reward that, that an individual might get from exercise mediated by this dopamine connection. So there's definitely the potential, you know, of it, after the clinical studies are done, you know, if there's a way to modulate specifically these communities that make the lipid amides or provide a lipid amide supplement, you could inherently, re you know, enhance the reward that individuals get for exercising and it can naturally be a remedy for a sedentary lifestyle. That's amazing. Now, what foods might be high in these lipid amides? Yeah, I actually asked the same question. So they are present in some foods, but it's a very low amount, mm -hmm. probably not enough to stimulate the effect that we're looking for. So it's probably going to be at the level of either um, a supplement form of these lipid amides or a prebiotic that's gonna preferentially boost the growth of, of bacteria, like eubacterium was one of the groups. So preferentially induce the growth of these. And then if we can figure out what food sources maybe are going to specifically boost the production of these molecules in the gut, we may be able to get it get at it through a prebiotic approach. I think it's super interesting. I, you know, I hopefully will be involved in the future studies in this area when and if I join the lab. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of promise here for people and it's not like, you know, you, then you don't have to rely so much on willpower to exercise. It's like, you're going to have that inherent motivation and I think it can be a real game changer. That's huge. I mean, yeah. there's just some people who they might go to the gym like January, you know, and then they stop February. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I've always wondered like, why is it like, I, like a lot of my friends, we love going to the gym and it's like, well, what if there is this new uh, hitherto undiscovered mechanism that impacts um, the, the reward centers and that dopamine that comes from that. So I think that's fascinating. Um, you mentioned um, that prebiotics can be selective. Like mm -hmm. over the last 10 years, it was kind of a shotgun approach. Like, oh, it's like fuel for the gut, like prebiotics. But now there's different forms of human oligosaccharides and different prebiotics that specifically impact certain, is it genres or? Yeah, genres would be a good, yeah, like different mm. a different genus of bacteria may have a specific food source that it enjoys, um, even down to like the family family 
uh, level or even key species. So there are certain molecules we know now like that serve as prebiotics that can maybe boost the level of key species in the gut. But definitely at the level of the genre, um, we've now established that uh, human milk oligosaccharides, like you mentioned, are a really potent food source for bifidobacteria in particular. And, you know, this, these molecules were initially discovered within human breast milk. Um, and that's kind of why, if we look at the infant gut microbiome, we get 90% or more bifidobacteria present there. It's because they, they basically just have access to this really potent food source for them. And, you know, now there's mar uh, products coming on, onto the market of human, containing human milk oligosaccharides. And essentially, you know, taking these as like a powder, as a supplement, can be used to boost levels of these bacteria in the, in the gut of an adult. And that's super powerful because we know bifidobacteria is a very, very important role in regulating whole body inflammatory status. So when bifidobacteria metabolize these HMOs or um, things like red polyphenols present in like different red fruits or vegetables, uh, essentially what's going to happen is that it's going to lead to the production of the two small organic acids, act acetate and lactate. Acetate's a short chain fatty acid and lactate's an organic acid. And these molecules go on to feed bacteria within the gut that produce butyrate butyrate being the main fuel source for colon cells, and also can be directly immunomodulatory to support anti-inflammatory uh, behaviors within these immune cells and also at the level of the whole body. So like just shifting immune polarity more towards a more anti-inflammatory state. And so this is also super important for certain people who have maybe mutations in the gene FUT2, which is associated with lower levels of bifidobacteria at, at the level of an adult. And individuals with mutations in this gene are more susceptible to developing inflammatory diseases like asthma, allergies, autoimmunity. And so, it, you know, now with these tools available, we can begin to augment bifidobacteria levels in adults and kind of prevent the either the development or onset of these conditions potentially. So it's, it can be very powerful. I love that. I mean, it seems like the prebiotic world has changed a lot before it was focused on inulin and FOS. But if you had SIBO or imbalances, it was like causing a lot of indigestion and bloating and things like that. So these, and I haven't supplemented with any of the new HMOs. Mm -hmm. I know there's a bunch that have come out from Europe and things like that. Are they a little bit more selective for this where the side effects for people that might have SIBO and things like that are not so concerning? That's a really good question. So I, in my practice, I work with cl uh, clients and I use them a lot, mm -hmm. uh, the HMOs. I also have used them myself and I had really bad IBS in the past that I, I used this HMO and like red polyphenol protocol to essentially cure myself. But for people with existing inflammation within the gut, essentially what happens is in an inflamed gut, the butyrate transport mechanisms become inhibited. And so if you're consuming, you know, fibers, HMOs, polyphenols that are going to stimulate butyrate production, either directly or indirectly, you're gonna get a buildup of these short chain fatty acids like butyrate, and that's gonna create gas and bloating. Mm. And so whenever I, you know, put a client onto this protocol, and they, you know, report back, they say, "Hey, I got like a pretty significant gas and bloating from this." Then I know I have to take a step back and deal with inflammation first, because if we can just get inflammation levels down, even acutely, then we can get that butyrate through the gut into the cells, and that's going to naturally begin to bring down oxygen levels, which Essentially what happens is we want the colon to be hypoxic. We, it's supposed to have low oxygen. And in an inflamed gut, oxygen levels begin to creep up, and that's partially because butyrate oxidation goes down, which butyrate has to be burned at the mitochondria, and the ultimate electron acceptor for mitochondria under production is oxygen. So mm -hmm. if we're inhibiting butyrate burning, we're essentially going to have oxygen levels begin creeping up. Um, and so if we can just bring down inflammation, even, you know, in the short term, get butyrate into those cells, then oxygen can begin to come down into like a feed forward mechanism that will just make everything else easier. Whereas in an inflamed gut, it's like also a feed forward mechanism in the opposite direction. It's like inflammation begets more inflammation. So we have to put like a, like something to stop that wheel and begin to push it the other direction. So typically what I'll do is like, you know, high dose omega threes, I'll do some liposomal like glutathione n acetylcysteine um, we'll do like kind of like an elimination diet to remove any food triggers that may trigger bloating gas really just to try to you know cool the gut down for at least a short period of time and then like after a week or two on that protocol we'll start like titrating in the hmos and see how you know their symptoms are and for the most part it's typically like after a couple weeks they begin to tolerate the HMOs very well and then begin to ramp up on that protocol and then everything begins like kind of cruising from there. That's amazing. Yeah. I've never heard that articulated in that way. That is so fascinating.
Um, doesn't butyrate also convert, and I don't know where, into um, but, um, beta-hydroxybutyrate into the main ketone body? Is there some inner conversion in the gut? So that's an interesting question. Um, for the most part, the, the pools are separate. Uh, there are some bacteria that may be able to like put the hydroxyl group onto butyrate to create 3-HB, 3-hydroxybutyrate. Um, but for the most part, butyrate produced in the gut is mostly from the fermentation of, of fibers and, and different prebiotics. And there are other species in the gut that are distinct from the species that make butyrate that can make 3-HB. But the vast majority of 3-HB that the gut's exposed to is going to be from like the host circulation and from like liver production of 3-HB. So there's like this interesting dynamic between um, in a fasted state, you'll imagine like low butyrate in, within the lining of the gut because you're not getting the fermentation of fibers because you're in a fasted state. But in that state, you're going to get increased production of 3-HB from the liver. So you kind of get this like compensatory uh, situation where like in the fasted state you have high 3-HB and in the fed state you have high butyrate. Um, but in either way, in either case, you're still getting either 3-HB or butyrate to the colon cells, which kind of need these similar molecules as fuel sources to like thrive optimally and keep a low oxygen environment within the colon. That is fascinating. Where does the, the research stand with regards to short chain fatty acid signatures as it's related to obesity, like high acetate and there was all that. Mm. I think like in 2012, 20, like the human microbiome, uh, human microbiome project era, there was all these sort of um, characterizations of this. Has that been sussed out? Is there any utility in looking at that in the stool and whatnot? Um, I think it's a good question. Like there was definitely some papers that showed like propionate was associated with a fatty liver and then like other papers that show like, you know, contradicting results in, in many cases. So it's like, for the most part, I think the project production of short chain fatty acids is good. But if the short chain fatty acids aren't being like taken up readily, then maybe you'll see higher levels in the stool, which could, you know, also reflect some not so good things. So because these molecules should be taken up by, by the cells within the gut and interacting with immune cells, but if they're if the gut is inflamed and you know this tra these transport mechanisms are inhibited, then you could imagine stool levels going up, which you know you might initially think that's good because it means there's more of them around, but it could also mean that they're just not being taken up as well. So it's kind of hard to parse out um, the cause of the increased levels. Um, so I think that would also like need future work to try to understand like the ratios between the different short chain fatty acids. That's another important feature, I think. So you, basically, you want a higher level. A butyrate relative to the other two and I know that acetate levels go up um, higher potentially in like um, in metabolic like metabolic dysfunction so I think future research needs to kind of parse out the optimal ratios of these short-chain fatty acids to one another and then like ultimately develop testing to like kind of understand how this can be used in like a more clinical setting interesting yeah um, you mentioned the the red polyphenols yeah was there another word that you used that I missed on? Um, red polyphenols. No, no, not really. That okay. was it, I think. Now, yeah. now there's a lot with like blueberry anthocyanidins and things yeah. like that, but you like the red. Is there more research? Oh, so I would consider anthocyanin one of the red ones. It's just like the, the density of the pigment would create like black or like dark, dark blue colors. So yeah, I would consider all those kind of lumped together, mm -hmm. the polyphenols in general. Yeah, they're and all good. So these are, these are foods that people should focus on that you generally recommend? Yeah, absolutely. So like dark fruits in general, things like berries, um, cherries, pomegranate, uh, red cabbage, beets, these would all contain these very like um, like a high density of these pigment molecules that are good food, food sources for both bifidobacteria and another group of bacteria that we spoke about off air, which was um, acromantia, which is super important for maintaining the health of the gut lining and gut barrier integrity. And um, what about um, green tea polyphenols and chocolate? I mean, I, I love chocolate, so of course I'm biased, but are those good fuel for some of these different bugs? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I think that the density tends to be a, a bit lower, perhaps, in, in these sources. But I mean, polyphenols in general are going to be good for the gut. Um, it just also depends on like what's coming along with it. So if it's like a lot of sugar coming along with it, then like you could kind of see that could weigh more towards the cons versus the pros side of things. But the polyphenols in general, I, I think will be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a theme within the microbiome research has been that diversity equals stability of the microbiome. Mm. Um, and again, I haven't followed this research for a number of years, so I'm, I'm not sure if that is still sort of the, the paradigm. Um, can you speak to diversity and the importance of that, or is that has that changed much? 
Yeah, so there's a couple different measures of diversity that people within the space care about. There's something called alpha and beta diversity. So they're they're kind of different in the in the aspect of like one is basically indicating how diverse a sample is within itself. So like how many different types of bacteria are present within a sample. And then the other is basically going to tell you, you know, how diverse this sample is compared to another sample. Um, and so people generally will care about, you know, how many different bacteria are present in a sample and they will associate that with some sort of resilience or like, uh, yeah, basically just a resilience against like outside pathogens or different insults that can come from the environment to the gut. Like I like to think about it as like an old growth forest versus like a monocrop agriculture setting. And it's like the more diversity you have on the land, the more robust that environment will be to, you know, uh, an outside pest coming in or some sort of, you know, just new exposure. So we, we know, obviously, like the monocrop agriculture setting requires a bunch of pesticides, herbicides, etc. to maintain itself, whereas the old growth forest will be robust to kind of whatever is thrown its way because it has this very, um, very evolved ecosystem of different organisms harmonizing together to, to create balance. Um, so I think that's a really, to me at least, it's a good way to think about the gut ecosystem too, that we want to have like a very different types of bacteria present that are going to each contribute uniquely to the ecosystem of the gut and influence uh, the host physiology and metabolism. That's amazing. And speaking of host physiology, there is some research showing that exercisers have generally more stability and greater diversity in key species like Acromenzia and Fecobacterium prisnitzii and so forth. How is it that exercise mechanistically, how does it impact the gut favorably? Is it because exercisers are eating differently or is it the actual movement of muscles that is changing? What's the chicken or the egg? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I, I don't think it's parsed out yet. I'm not you know, I'm not like super religious on staying on top of the newest research necessarily. Like I am very invested in certain areas of the field, but I definitely have some thoughts on that. And basically my thoughts would be during exercise, you're getting enhanced blood flow to the periphery. So like the limbs, uh, the working muscles essentially. And what that does is it pulls blood away from the gut. So what I'm guessing might happen is that you're getting kind of an enhanced, like lower oxygen, levels within the gut during exercise that can promote the growth of these obligate anaerobes, these these bacteria that require low oxygen levels to survive and thrive. So I'm, I think the, the blood flow aspect may be an important contributor to the, the changes that we see in, in uh, bacterial composition within the gut. There's probably also effects of like, we know muscles, uh, a secretory organ of like myokines. So these myokines may be having direct or indirect effects on inflammation levels for sure at like the whole body level uh, and maybe in the gut specifically. So this could be influencing, you know, if we're bringing inflammation down, that's going to also influence oxygen levels within the gut, um, which we know is important for these really um, anaerobic bacteria. So those are like two ways that I could see exercise modulating gut bacteria. There's probably also some relationship between like feeding behaviors too. Um, but I think that would need to be parsed out probably in a lab setting. That's interesting. Yeah. And um, you were talking about some research specifically within athletes and the microbiome shifts and the exercise intensity and volume and things like that. Mm. Um, there was one study I remember in 2014 in rugby players that looked at the diversity compared to calorie matched non-athletes. And despite a much higher calorie intake, there was like greater stability and diversity in the rugby players because of the exercise. Mm -hmm. um, so help us understand sort of the connection. I mean, that was great right there. But what, what is, you know, how for, for a takeaway for people that have IBS or a lot of constipation, right? Mm -hmm. Why should they be exercising? And what is the research sort of showing there with gut health? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think right now, a lot of what we see is observational, like from a mechanistic standpoint, like I obviously just like gave a couple ideas of what could be going on. But from like a like a clinical standpoint, or what we're, we're observing in the space is that, you know, individuals with any sort of inflammatory is issues, um, or things like constipation are going to benefit massively from having a regular exercise routine. That's probably going to consist of like both resistance training and aerobic training, ideally. Um, and that essentially we're going to be getting, you know, enhanced peristalsis. So that will help people with um, constipation to be more regular. And then for inflammatory issues, like I mentioned, muscle is an endocrine organ now that's well established. And we know that myokines like IL-6 can directly impact immune function and 
although it creates an acute inflammatory response, the response over time is actually going to be anti-inflammatory. So this will help um, anybody dealing with inflammatory issues at the level of the gut or other areas of the body to shift that immune response to be more anti-inflammatory and begin to spin down some of the symptoms that they may be experiencing in response to different inflammation um, attacks that they may have. Fascinating. So there's a lot of people that are benefiting clinically from a zero carbohydrate diet, like all meat diets. Mm -hmm. um, I have my thoughts or hypotheses as to why this may be. Of course, you're gonna have more even blood sugar levels and things like that because if you're not getting carbohydrates and so forth, but a lot of these people also have autoimmune disease generally, not all of them, but a large subset of the people that generally benefit from a carnivore diet have psoriasis, rosacea, IBS, whatever. Um, are you concerned with that long-term, um, the lack of polyphenols or things? There's been some people, I have a friend, Sean Baker, he's been all meat diet since I think 2016 or something like that. Mm -hmm. He's 55, thriving. What are your thoughts and perspectives on that? Yeah, so I think there definitely may be the outliers that do great on the diet long term. Um, but I think, you know, in the short term, carnivore diets, basically just a really strict elimination diet in my view. And like, of course, if you're going from like a standard American diet to a carnivore diet, that's going to be a big step up quality wise, like, um, you're just going to be eliminating a lot of the preservatives and, you know, highly processed ingredients that are going into, uh, you know, like junk food, basically. So sure, eliminating that stuff is going to help. Um, also, of course, eliminating carbs is going to help for a lot of people who are dealing with like uh, insulin resistance and just issues tolerating glucose, uh, which obviously can lead to things like fungal overgrowth, which can drive psoriasis and other skin issues and kind of raise its head in a, in a whole host of ways. But so I think it definitely makes sense uh, in that context that a, at least in the short term, carnivore diet can be very powerful to help regulate blood sugar levels. Um, also improves satiety. So like people will just feel more satisfied after having more protein in a meal. So meeting protein, uh, like adequate protein benchmarks will also be great. Um, but I think, you know, in the long term, it really could be more harmful than beneficial, particularly for the gut, which really needs uh, a lot of these fibers around to ferment and create that low pH environment that is essential for the growth of commensal species. Um, like, you know, the butyrate producers, bifidobacteria, acromantia. Uh, when you're eating a lot of protein, you're basically getting nitrogen spilling over into the colon, which when nitrogen and amino acids become fermented, it actually leads to the production of these alkaloids that increase pH in that environment. And higher pH is associated with the growth of different bacteria that are typically more uh, represented within the small intestine. And these are called like the facultative anaerobes, so they can kind of thrive in either like low oxygen or high oxygen lev levels. And they just produce different types of metabolites that aren't conducive to cellular metabolism within the colon. And this results in like increased pH levels in this environment, which is kind of known over time to be a potential driver of colon cancer. So I'm concerned about that in the long term. Um, we really need some of these like fermentable molecules like fibers, polyphenols, things like HMOs that can maintain a lower pH in the colonic environment. And we know that that's protective ag against colon cancer. Um, so that's definitely something that's on my mind. I think in the short term, people get benefit and that's amazing. But I think you can still eat a mostly meat diet and also still get these molecules in and likely get even more benefit out of the diet, not less. So I think that's something that needs to be studied more closely. And, and we ne really need to understand the long-term implications of like ketogenic and carnivore diets because they're being so commonly used these days and people just don't know the potential drawbacks over time. And so, you know, I actually see a lot of people, you know, in the clinical space where they've been on a ketogenic or carnivore diet for a long term and now they start to try to eat carbs again and they're completely glucose intolerant slash it's like an insulin resistance phenotype but we don't i actually don't think it's insulin resistance i think it's glucose intolerance and like low insulin production so their body is having trouble ramping up insulin production after such a long period of time of not having to engage that system and so this is a real issue to me because we need to know whether or not we can like restore insulin production or is this like going to be a problem for years or even like a lifetime so we really need to know that information and to get there we really need the studies that look at long-term effects um you know even just in rodents we need to know what's going on mm, that is so fascinating i mean we do see a lot of dichotomous thinking like oh 
all carbs must be bad, you know, if you're benefiting from a keto diet. And so some of the foods that I would generally include if I'm doing like a carnivore approach would be olives and ferments and some lower carb things, but then still focusing on the potential polyphenolic compounds, hydroxytyrosol and all that in olives. Um, what do you think about ferments, the importance of having ferments, especially if one is considering going on a, a carnivore low carb diet? Yeah, absolutely. I think ferments can be great, uh, depending on like the issues people are having. If they already have an inflamed gut, they may not be able to introduce them right away because you're going to get the production of like these short chain fatty acids um, that can create like bloating and gas. So if people are already dealing with that, you know, I could see them maybe being on the carnivore diet for a week or two weeks or maybe even a month before starting to introduce them. But the ferments are really important. And the Sonnenberg lab out in California, they showed that essentially a, a high fermented food diet was more effective than a high fiber diet at improving markers of diversity and overall gut health. So I think the implementation, like the integration of fermented foods can be super beneficial for individuals looking to optimize gut microbiome composition, gut health, digestion, um, and just overall setting themselves up for like healthy inflammatory and aging process. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I could totally see, you know, things like natto, kimchi, sauerkraut being great additions to somebody who's trying to maintain a lower carb diet, but still getting these good molecules in uh, to feed the bacteria that are associated with the healthy aging process. That's awesome. I was in uh, Seoul, South Korea, and there were some elderly doctors that I was visiting with and <clears throat> things like that. And they were telling me that obviously obesity is hitting all parts of Asia, but particularly Seoul as well. And they were saying that it's because the mothers are not making kimchi at home anymore. They're just mm. buying it from the store and it isn't fermented as long and all of that. Now, of course, that's like their own perspective, but like these people are in their 60s and 70s and like have noticed this trend, like moms are working more and they usually would be the ones in the, of the parents to make the kimchi and it's such a staple right. in Asia. So it's interesting that in America, we don't have these sort of traditions, right? No one, unless you come from Asia or something like that, where it's part of the, the culture, um, we, we don't historically eat a lot of fermented foods. And I think that's a big part of, um, part of the diversity issue and then all the IBS and skin issues. I, I have tried to make that a, a thing in my household and now my daughter's like digging it. She loves having kimchi. So it's like, cool. you know, at first these might taste sort of sour or bitter or, or whatever, for, but then once you get used to them, they, they become part of the diet. And all you have to do is travel to Asia and it's like before and after meals, like that's what you do. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know why we don't embrace that here. It's like, it's interesting. Totally. And I mean, those cultures are much older than ours and like they figured out a thing or two over the years that, you know, we have yet to embrace, I think. And I'm just very interested overall in like ancient food wisdom. Like we know, like there's science supporting different food combinations now. Like we know like black pepper enhances the absorption of like curcumin from turmeric and like, you know, in India, they've been using black pepper with turmeric for a long, long time. Also like combining coconut milk with that. So it's a fat soluble molecule. So that's going to naturally enhance its absorption. So I think it's really interesting and important to think about um, the types of foods and food combinations that people have been using for thousands of years and starting to unpack that wisdom. And I think it's like largely untapped and we can learn a lot from these cultures. Absolutely. Okay. So if you were to try to get funding for a study like that, right, would it be easier to get funding from a biotech company who's create this proprietary curcumin molecule or study, get funding and edge funding or whatever to study like a mixture of bioperin, turmeric and coconut milk, would, would that be on par? Or would it be much easier to get funding from industry? Like, yeah, that's a good question. If there's patented like delivery systems or something like this, it could be, you know, it could be easier to get the funding from the people who made that, um, or like are, are, are championing it, its use. But mm. I think it really varies. It depends on like the interests of like, you know, what the applications of it are going to be and and what other medications it might be offsetting. I think there can be some conflicts there. Um, but yeah, I think I think the funding is there for basically anybody who has like the the wherewithal to pursue it. It's just it can be kind of hard to find. And there is, I think, some gatekeeping within science that just makes it really hard to conduct good research, especially if you're trying to be like an independent scientist. Like if I, as a PhD, wanted to do research, you know, in a lab that I set up myself, I would, when I'm submitting a paper to, let's say, Nature, pay like $12,000 to submit a paper to them. And it's like, so my research that I'm doing can't even be seen because I don't have this grant funding and institutional support to get the information out there to the public. So there's like an interesting conundrum there. Um, that's like favoring the labs that have a lot of this like government support and grant funding to do the research that's 
then feeding forward to support the objectives and the aims of these agencies. So it's like an interesting problem, I think. I think we need to do more crowdfunding and like privately funded research. That would be great. I think MAPS is actually a really good example of that. Like yeah. they got a lot of crowdsourcing and like private funders to support their psychedelic research. And now they've like, you know, completed phase two, three, phase three trials. And like they're really pushing pushing the envelope with like MDMA and psilocybin. So I think that's like a really po powerful and like inspiring example of like the power of more research that's like not in the interests of like the governing bodies and more so in the interests of the actual people uh, of the country. So I think it's really cool. That's amazing. How would that be facilitated in natural medicine? Would you think like how would one go about that? Would it would it take an organization like? the polyphenol society or whatever to put put together some funding and everyone chipped in to to conduct some of these studies yeah or? i think that would be you know a good way to go about it and then finding labs that maybe have interest in natural products and are just from like a basic research understanding and less so like the more translational research labs which are focused on like getting immediate medical outcomes and like focusing on the diseases that the nih is interested in for example um getting more of these research labs that are very interested in just like purely the science at a basic level would be great. Like recruiting uh, the resources that they have, like the different instrumentation they have access to. And then if the funding is available to them, they'll be more incentivized to do that type of research. So I think probably at, at the level, the level of the funding should probably come first, but there's got to also be initiative from people to, you know, show interest in wanting to do the research in order for like, like that synergy to happen. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting problem though. Yeah, super fascinating. Alexis, um, do you share information on social media and things like that? or I do, okay. yeah. Um, I'm on Instagram primarily at Alex, uh, Dr. Alexis Jasmine. It's like J-A-Z-M-Y-N. And I share a lot of you know information that I am passionate about on there, often relating to gut health, um, dental health recently, because I always had issues with dental health, and I've recently come on to like, some tools that have been really major for me, so I've been sharing on that. I also share on like metabolic health in general, optimizing uh, insulin sensitivity, uh, different exercise modalities, how they can be helpful. Um, yeah, but overall, that's my primary platform. I do see clients and everything is through my Instagram. Like I have a link in my bio to apply to work with me and uh, I'm gonna be going back for the postdoc most likely like next year, but I'm gonna still be seeing people. It's like a really important part of my life now that I wanna hold on to, to keep me like fresh and on the front lines of what people are needing. and. Uh, going to be using that to inform my research directions and and kind of just keep me grounded in in what people are actually looking to learn and having issues with. Uh, awesome. But yeah, that's me. <laughs> and then for oral health, what have, what have you found? Are you mouth taping at night? Uh, so I, I was for a bit. Now, like I've trained myself mostly to sleep with my mouth closed. So mm -hmm. I was using mouth tape for like a month or two because um, dry mouth is probably the biggest cause of cavities that nobody talks about. Mm -hmm. Um, saliva is essential for maintaining a higher pH in the mouth, which is crucial for like mineralization of the teeth. Um, but also in addition to that, I started using like a nano hydroxy appetite toothpaste mm. and like literally last January, my teeth were starting to get like translucent. And this was probably because of dry mouth. My mom had just passed away and like I had just graduated. I went through like so much stress in my life. And so I think I was just having issues with that. My teeth started looking like translucent. So I was freaking out and I started on this nano hydroxy appetite toothpaste. And literally within a week and a half, like my teeth went from translucent to like opaque and white. Wow. It was so powerful. And like I have before and after pictures too um, that I could share with you. But so I was using that. Also optimized my vitamin D status for like the first time in my life. I'd always kind of been deficient. So I did that um, with a broad spectrum K2 supplement as well. So those, those are kind of the directions I've been hitting it. And I had my first dental checkup like last month. And it was the first time in my entire life that I'd never had a cavity. So it was like so amazing for me that's amazing yeah what's the brand that makes this hydroxy appetite nano there are a couple brands the one that i use is called boca it's spelled b-o-k-a um they yeah just make a daily toothpaste you basically brush with it twice a day like you would normal and then you just don't rinse you like keep it on your teeth you just spit it out mm. um and then that kind of lets it sit on the teeth and, and get into the mineral matrix and hydroxy appetite is the mineral that makes up teeth so it's like bioidentical mm -hmm. Um, and so, it's, yeah, it's been really powerful. And actually, I should also mention that I had three cavities from like a couple years ago, right before the pandemic, that I never got filled on my left side that were completely reversed when I went back to the dentist this time for my x ray So like, not only can the remineralization help prevent cavities, but can also reverse these like very surface level cavities that a dentist may be quick to fill because it's like a quick buck for them. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is so fascinating. It's amazing how the mouth is a gateway to health. I mean, with Truly. the microbiome and, and all of that and how many people are unaware of this. Yes. You know? um, Listerine mouthwashes and 
mouth breathing. I mean, there's like so many things that um, that contribute to poor dental health. Yeah, um, absolutely. That is so interesting. Mouthwash is really a really good one, an antiseptic mouthwash, because it's been shown now for a few years that uh, basically there's certain bacteria within the mouth that convert dietary uh, nitrates into the nitrates that can influence our blood pressure and maintain healthy blood pressure. And then if you use antiseptic mouthwash, essentially, if you eat something like beetroots that's really high in nitrate, you fail to get the, the response of nitric oxide within the circulation. So if you're going to be using antiseptic mouthwash, well, first of all, you shouldn't be using it. But if you do use it, you're not going to get the, the benefits of dietary nitrate and the influence on nitric oxide. And it can actually like acutely inhibit exercise performance because there's this very close link to blood flow and, nit and nitric oxide. Um, so it's a, like a really important consideration. Like we have this oral microbiome that's playing this very essential role and not just the mouth level, but the whole body level. And I think this area is going to keep emerging and we're going to find out just how important it is. I mean, another just very kind of basic interaction is that like if we don't have good dental health, and our teeth start to break down, we can't really chew meat anymore. So that's decreasing protein bioavailability. That's going to influence like and in, promote frailty later in life. And we know like frailty is like a major cause of mortality. And like we all have a story of, you know, knowing somebody who's older who falls and breaks their hip and like basically never recovers. It's all downhill from there. And that's because there's not enough muscle mass to maintain integrity of, of, of the bones and also just like create stability within the, the structure of the body as a whole. So protein bioavailability is just going to be something that's influenced by your ability to chew meat. So people who do have dental issues should be eating more ground meat. There was a study out of um, a lab in Amsterdam in, in, in the Netherlands that showed that ground meat is the protein is much more bioavailable than like eating a whole cut of meat. So for people who do have dental issues, like opting for ground meat, that will increase their ability to get amino acids from that protein and can help to promote muscle mass um, if they're dealing with issues. That is so fascinating. The yeah. mouthwash and endothelial dysfunction is, yes. is there a connection with mouthwash and erectile dysfunction then as well? Absolutely. Because this is also related to nitric oxide production. Um, so if we're going to get, we're getting optimal nitric oxide production from having these commensal bacteria within the mouth that are converting the dietary nitrate into nitric oxide, that's going to help anything related with blood flow, including like cognition, erectile dysfunction, endothelial function in general. That is crazy. I mean, I consider myself versed in research and I had no idea of this. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is very yeah. practical because, um, you know, if I go to friends' bathrooms and stuff, they uh, Listerine and these mouthwash, it's everywhere. Like, yeah, it it's really very is. prominent and not many people know about that. I'm yeah. sure you have like a million other tips and tricks in that brain. Of Probably. Yours. I don't even know, but you'd have to say like a trigger word and they'd be like, oh yeah, I think Bing, I remember something Bing, about steady. this. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing this great wisdom and I'll put your um, Instagram handle below and so forth so people can connect with you. Great. Thank you so much. This was very impromptu and like such a nice surprise. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.